Hi, everybody. So today we are uh, very happy to have Jennifer Rollo, who is working on Atlas, and uh, she got her PhD from Harvard uh, a few years ago, and now she's at Brookhaven National Lab, but uh, physically located at Soren, and she's going to talk about her uh, experience with uh, QCD studies with JETS. Great. So, yeah, thanks for the introduction, and, yeah, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, so, yeah, I'll be talking today about um, how we can study QCD, quantum carbone dynamics, um, using JETS uh, and the ATLAS detector. Um, but before I get into that, I think it's useful to take a step back and talk about what experiment I'm working on and what are the big questions that we're trying to answer. So I work on the ATLAS experiment, um, which is um, one of the four main experiments at the Large Hadron Collider, which is a particle accelerator on the border of Switzerland and France. Um, and this, uh, this accelerator was built in order to answer a lot of big questions about the universe and the fundamental nature of particles. Um, a non, a completely non-extensive list here is, you know, what are the particles that exist? Um, how do they interact? Um, are there other particles that we can produce that could explain the evidence for dark matter? Um, why is there more matter than antimatter in the universe? You know, how can we better understand, you know, electroweak symmetry breaking and the origins of mass? Um, and much more. Um, and um, in order to answer these questions, we must first have a model that we can understand to, uh, that can make predictions for what we should be seeing. Um, because if we don't know what we should be seeing, then we can't answer if we are seeing something new that can explain um, some of these open questions. Um, and so this is why we have the standard model, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, but in the, in the standard model, we have several classes of particles which, are, uh, which have interactions that are governed by various properties of them. Um, so their charge, their color, their spin, their mass, um, et cetera. Um, and you can see yeah, just kind of a list of all of the different particles here. Um, we have you know, quarks, leptons, bosons, um, yeah, all of which, or most of which, uh, uh, with the exception of neutrinos, we can study at the LHC. Um, and the standard model has provided a, a really robust um, way of understanding particle interactions. Um, and it's been tested extensively both at uh, experiments at the LHC and in other places as well. Um, you can see here just kind of a summary plot of uh, many of the different measurements that have been made by the ATLAS experiment um, about different processes um, that are testing different couplings of different particles. Um, you can see that these span many orders of magnitude um, ranging, you know, uh, and you can see comparisons of the theory um, predictions to the actual measurements that we've made at uh, the ATLAS experiment. Um, and you can see very good agreement in general between the theory predictions and what we are actually observing. Um, and so this is to say that, you know, we, this is a really good model for what we should, um, you know, it, it describes really well the data that we have, um, spanning a, a really wide range of cross sections. Oh, there certainly is, and there's, for, for a lot of different reasons, some of this is because the theory predictions don't work as well as uh, maybe you would hope because they're complicated uh, things to uh, predict. There's places where the experimental um, uncertainties are a little bit complicated. I mean, I think a lot of the disagreement that you're going to see will come more from the differential cross sections, and these are generally the inclusive cross section measurements where there's going to be less. I, I haven't looked uh, really deeply at all of this. I mean, there's maybe a couple of these where you can see some disagreements, but um, I mean, yeah, in general, we get good agreement. Um, so yeah, it's not that necessarily, you know, there's never any tensions, but in general, it does provide a good model for this. Um, and you can see um, a lot of these different final states um, involve, you know, uh, photons, which we can measure directly. Um, other things like W, Z, um, top pigs, which we actually measure their decay products for. Um, but one thing to note here is that for, you know, a lot of these particles aren't showing up here. So in particular, um, the quarks, uh, with the exception of tops, um, and the gluon aren't showing up here directly. Um, and this is in part because we don't actually observe these uh, particles themselves or their decay products per se. We actually observe what are called jets. And I'll get into this more in a minute. Um, but they essentially, you know, just to give a quick summary of what they are, is they are these kind of sprays of particles produced when we have high energy interactions involving quarks and gluons. Um, and we, you know, observe these sprays of particles in our detector, not the individual quarks and gluons themselves. 
So this is a little bit distinct from how we observe uh, many of these other particles, either by looking for them directly or looking for um, their decay products. So in this talk, there are three main questions I want to answer. Um, so the first is mostly to get, uh, make sure we're all on the same page about what I'm going to be talking about, which is what is a jet even, and how do we reconstruct them with a detector? And then the main topic uh, that I'll want to be covering today is how can we better understand and model jet formation? Um, so what can we actually learn um, by looking inside of these jets um, about QCD? And how can we do this better in the future? Um, and then the final question, which is a little bit intermingled within all of this, is you know, how will these developments uh, enable other improvements um, and ena enable other research at the LHC and beyond? Um, so to jump right in with um, you know, how we re reconstruct jets and what they are, um, I want to first talk about the ATLAS experiment just for a, a few slides. Um, so you can see here a picture of the ATLAS experiment, and it's uh, very obvious from this that this is both a giant experiment, you can see a person um, or two for scale. Um, and it's also a very compl complex experiment. There are many different components of it, many of which you can't even see in this, in this picture. Um, but in, in some ways we can think about this in a very simplified manner where it's a series of you know, concentric detector parts which are uh, tailored for uh, certain types of detection. So we want this to, the experiment to be as general purpose as possible. We want to be looking at all of these different types of final states, these different particles that we can produce in the standard model. Um, we're not trying to just study one particular question. And so we want it to be general purpose enough that we can uh, measure all of the different particles uh, with the exception of neutrinos again. Um, <clears throat> so on the very inside of the detector, we have the tracking detectors. Um, and these are really good for measuring the angular, or for measuring the momentum of charged particles. Um, so especially uh, for lower PT particles, um, it, it works really well. Um, and the thing to note here is that, uh, uh, as you might imagine, tracking detectors only are going to measure charged particles in general. Um, and so, yeah, this is really useful, but only if you have something with charge. So for a photon, for instance, this is not generally so useful. Uh, surrounding this, we have two calorimeters. Um, we have the electromagnetic and the hydronic calorimeter. Um, I won't go into the differences here, but they, their goals are essentially the same, which is to measure the energy of particles very precisely. Um, so this is uh, a little bit distinct from trackers where it's not so focused on uh, resolving individual particles. It's more trying to resolve the amount of energy that was uh, produced in these collisions. Um, and these have some limitations in um, their angular resolution based on just the detector um, design, um, but they are able to measure the energy really well, especially as you go to higher energies. So in some ways very complementary to um, the tracker. Um, and then surrounding all of this, we have the, the muon spectrometers, um, which I won't be covering more today, but are obviously an important part of the ATLAS detector, but um, not so relevant for talking about jets. Um, so if you want to reconstruct jets, um, as I'm, I'll, I'll go through a little bit more in detail in a minute, but if you just imagine a spray of particles, these will be charged and neutral particles. Um, there's a few different ways you can imagine reconstructing these. So the first way you might think about is just using the calorimeter, because if you want to measure all of the energy of all the particles um, and not miss any of the, uh, the neutral particles, um, then the calorimeter is really the place to do this. Um, so this is something that Atlas used for many years, um, what we call topo clusters or clusters, if I refer to this later. Um, but these are just using calorimeter information to reconstruct inputs to uh, reconstruct your jets. However, you know, as I mentioned before, there are some limitations to this. Um, so another way that you could think about doing this is just using the trackers or the tracking information. Um, which gives you really good angular resolution, really good um, ability to distinguish between different particles that were produced. Um, but again, this is going to miss, you know, around a third of your jet, this is going to miss all of the neutral particles. So this is also a, an incomplete way of doing things, but useful in some contexts. Um, and now, if, as you can probably imagine, there's a, a third way of doing things, which is combining these two pieces of information into something more powerful. Um, and I don't want to go through this in detail. I'm happy to talk to, uh, about this with anyone later. Um, but this is a, a complicated problem, and there's no single solution to this because um, you don't just have one single um, 
calorimeter object that corresponds to a single track object. Um, and so you, know, you have to fig figure out how to combine all of this information into something usable. Um, on CMS, you just have one such algorithm for this. On Atlas, we have three. Um, unfortunately, with you know, each their own acronym, um, though we're moving just to using UFOs. Um, but uh, yeah, um, yeah, the, these all behave a little bit distinct, but I, I won't be covering these more today. So just, I wanna mention this, but um, I, I won't be coming back to this. Okay, so um, yeah, now I want to talk actually about what is a jet itself. Um, so as I mentioned before, I think, um, quarks and gluons, we don't actually observe these uh, directly. We actually observe um, the collimated sprays of particles that they produce. Um, and so when you produce a quark or a gluon in an interaction, um, these quarks or gluons will shower. Um, and then those uh, the things that they've showered or they've radiated themselves will also shower. And so at the end, you'll end up with some kind of mess of particles. Um, but uh, the reason that they shower and that we don't observe them directly is because we can't observe um, you know, these colored states. Uh, we, th these aren't really stable. We have um, color confinement, which means that we can only observe color neutral states. Um, and so you, know, you have this mess of your, 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 your showering, um, and at the end, um, instead what you actually observe in the detector is um, some set of particles uh, called hadrons, um, which are when these particles have combined into color neutral states. Um, so the, the parton shower, which is um, this part here, um, this is a, um, pretty similar to what we will actually see in the detector because the hadronization, um, the going from the partons to the hadrons, it's mostly going to impact your collinear structure. So things won't move around too much, but the amount of particles you have will change a bit and um, other aspects of the jet will change slightly. Um, but of course, you know, it's really difficult to translate these individual hadrons into the physics we're trying to study. Um, the way that we go from these partons to these hadrons, this is non-perturbative physics. Um, and so we can't really have good, easy, or easily have predictions for you know, a five hadron final state or a 20 hadron final state. Um, so instead, if we want to actually do any physics that involves quarks and gluons, um, we need something that translates these final states of hadrons that we actually observe in the detector um, into something that corresponds more to the actual um, hard process that involves the quark or the gluon. Um, and that's what we call a jet um, is you know, something that corresponds more, you know, cor it, it correlates this, these, this hadron, hadronic final state um, into something that is related to the underlying quark or gluon. So um, just to give a sense of what this looks like in our detector, so here if you look at this event, this is a dijet event or a two jet event. And if you look at this picture, probably you can point out where the two jets are. It's pretty obvious that there are you know, two back-to-back -back things coming out of this collision point in the center. Um, and it's pretty easy to tell where uh, these jets are and what particles are probably associated to them. Um, you can see in the middle, we have the trackers, and then outside of this, we have the calorimeters, um, which is where kind of this blocky um, picture comes into play. However, it's not always this simple. Um, so here I have an event display of an event which, with many more jets. And I think here, looking at this picture, it's a lot harder to tell even exactly how many jets there are. And even if you think you know that, you know, it's going to be hard to say you know, which of these particles are going to be associated to which jet because these are often close together. So how do you actually define this in a meaningful way that we can actually you know, reproduce? So we typically have a few different algorithms that we can use uh, for these. Um, there's just two that I want to talk about, but both of them are um, what, what's called sequential recombination algorithms. Um, and the way these work is you first start by, you make some sort of distance metric to determine what is the closest pair of particles in your event. Um, there are two that I want to just briefly mention here, um, and these are relevant later, which is why I'm mentioning this. So the first is the cambridge aachen algorithm, which just uses an angular distance metric. So it's uh, very, intuitive way of looking at things where things that are close together, if you just look at a picture of your event, um, are going to be things that are clustered together. Um, and this is really nice because this is kind of how the parton shower forms. It's a very, ang it tends, the way that the parton shower happens tends to be relatively angle ordered. So 
wide angle emissions tend to happen sooner in the shower and uh, later emissions tend to be more collinear. So this algorithm is really nice because it um, is correlated to the actual physics that is happening. Um, but it makes jets that are kind of hard for us to use experimentally. Um, so typically, if you've worked with jets, you've probably worked with what's called anti-KT jets, um, which use a different distance metric, which is really nice experimentally. Um, I don't really need to go into the details of how this uh, metric works, just uh, mentioning this in case you're wondering why we use a different um, type of algorithm um, for, for different contexts. So once we have any distance metric, it doesn't matter what it is, um, the way this works is you cluster the pair of particles that are together, um, that are closest, into a pseudojet. So looking at this event, maybe we say that these are the two closest particles based on an angular distance. And we cluster these together and we're left with a single particle. So we have n minus one particles that we are now using in our clustering algorithm. And you continue on, you keep finding the next closest pair of particles um, and you keep doing this until you have no particles that are very close together. Um, and once you have no particles that are close together, you stop your clustering. Um, and by close together, this is a tunable parameter that you have in your, your jets. Um, so at the end, you're left with just, a, you know, maybe a single particle in this case, but it could be many, many particles if you have many jets. Um, but you're left with something that is, you know, this is, this is a four momentum object that we can define. But this also is a four momentum object that has a, an inherent structure of how the particle um, clustering happened. So it has this clustering history, which has a lot of information potentially about the physics that went into it. Um, depending on what algorithm you're using, it can have it can be related or completely unrelated. Um, but you know there is a lot of information that goes into the jet itself. Um, so this is um, you know what ha how this uh, clustering happens, where these particles are distributed. This is what we call jet substructure. Um, and so potentially, if you can use it well, there is a lot of information that you can learn from looking inside these jets. Um, you can learn about the running of alpha s, you can learn about hadronization, you can learn about correlations between particles, you can learn about color flow, um, and a lot more. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, one, one thing I wanted to mention, um, I think I should have mentioned this a little bit earlier, but um, I think here's a good place as well is that you know, this is obviously, a, a modeling this well is very challenging. And if we want to you know, use predictions for anything that we want to do with the LHC, we need to have models, we need to have predictions um, in order to study things. But making, uh, making predictions for things involving jets is difficult. And um, our ability to model this is something that limits um, many of the analyses that we want to do to understand some of the bigger picture questions that I was talking about earlier. Um, and so while this is trying to answer fundamental questions about QCD, this also really applies broadly to the bigger questions that we want to answer as well. So this is what JET is. Um, you know, how can we actually use this information? So if we want to actually use this in a meaningful way, then we're going to want to compare this to some sort of prediction. Some of this could be Monte Carlo predictions. Um, some of this could be analytical predictions. Um, there's a lot of different things that we can look at. Um, so just as a, a to get into one of the complications of using jets in this way, especially using jet substructure, let's take a toy example where we say that we have these two jets here. Um, here we're going to use a different jet radius than I was showing on the previous slide. So we have two jets instead of one, um, but it doesn't matter so much. So imagine now that instead of having the picture we had on this slide, we add a really soft or low PT, low energy um, gluon emission off of this gluon here. Um, and this maybe gets clustered into the other jet. Um, so this is a really low energy particle, low PT uh, particle, transverse momentum um, particle. And so this isn't really going to change the energy of the jet by very much. Um, so this is fine if you're just trying to make a prediction for um, a jet form momentum. This isn't really going to make any impact on anything. That being said, if you want to actually look at the structure of a jet, um, the jet substructure, then this is going to add something that can be um, a little bit more impactful because this includes angular information. Um, and so this is by adding something that's a really wide angle, even though it's low, low PT, low, low energy, um, this can have a pretty big impact on some observables that you might want to reconstruct. So things like the jet mass, for instance, could be very impacted by this. 
Um, so in order to deal with this for different predictions, um, one of the ways around this is by um, removing um, emissions like this uh, from, your, from your jet in a nice theoretically sound way. Um, and one of these, um, what, this is what we tend to call jet grooming. There are many types of grooming algorithms, um, but the one that is really nice theoretically is what's called the soft drop algorithm. Um, and so if we remove this in a nice, nice sound way, then we can make actually uh, theory predictions for these observer observables. So I'll just quickly go through the soft drop algorithm. Um, so the way this works, and the, way, the reason I was showing you these kind of trees before, is imagine you have, you know, these are some calorimeter objects, Energy cor corresponds to how big they are. Um, and imagine you have a jet here, which is clustered in some way. And here, the nearest things aren't always clustered together because we're using the anti-KG algorithm. Um, but of course, this is not really correlated to the underlying physics. Um, and so you can recluster all of these constituents in your jet into the same jet, but with a different history. So you recluster them with the cambridge aachen algorithm, which is that angle-ordered metric, which really relates to the actual parton shower. So it's the same constituents, different history. And then you just, uh, you check if the, um, basically you look at the PT balance of the um, last two jets uh, that were clustered into the final jet. So we'll say J1 and J2. Um, and you see if they're relatively balanced. And if they aren't, this means that maybe this is one of these emissions that you aren't able to really control very well. And so you remove it from your jet. Um, and then you continue on, so you remove the lower PT1 from your jet, this one is at lower transverse momentum, um, and you continue on and you check the next, uh, you uncluster the next part and you see if that passes. In this case, these are pretty well balanced, so it passes, and this is your jet. The details of the algorithm are not super important here, um, but the, the main, main takeaway here is that um, this is a, a way of um, removing stuff from your jet which allows you to make theoretical predictions for it. So the first measurement I want to talk about is the measurement of the jet mass. Um, and the jet mass is a really fundamental quantity um, about a jet in many senses. It's something that we have um, used for many types of jet taggers before. Um, it's you know part of its form momentum, of course. Um, so it's really, in many ways, a very fundamental component of a jet. Um, but for a long time, this was not something that we had theory predictions for that we could you know compare experimental measurements to because um, we didn't have good theoretically sound ways of removing radiation from our jets. Um, and yeah, quarks and gluons themselves are very light in general, aside from you know, the top quark. Um, but jets themselves can be very massive because of all of this radiation that they have in them. So with the development of the soft drop algorithm, this enabled theoretical predictions that we could compare to, um, which meant we wanted to actually test if these, measure, these predictions do a good job of um, predicting what we actually see. So in our measurement, we really wanted to test these predictions. So um, we did a couple of things. We, so we didn't measure the mass directly. We actually measured the mass over the PT squared. Um, and the reason for this is that the mass of the jet grows with the PT of the jet. Um, and so by dividing by the PT, you're removing a lot of the under, your dependence on the underlying PT spectrum. Um, in addition, we also measured this on a log scale because this made us really sensitive to the part of the theory predictions that we are actually interested in testing. Um, and so, yeah, with this, um, one other thing to point out here is that one of the reasons this is possible in the first place is that after you've applied soft drop grooming, um, the jet mass calculation is factorizable. And so different effects appear in different places in the jet mass distribution. So you can see here uh, the row distribution. This is not our measurement. This is just um, from one of the theory predictions. Um, in the high mass region, which is up here, um, this is where the fixed order part of the calculation comes into play, which is something that we could always do. But in the middle region here, this is where um, the resummation is really important. So this is really what this, these predictions were tackling and why we were doing this on a log scale. And finally, uh, and yeah, this is really testing our understanding of the parton showers themselves. And finally, in the lowest mass region, this is where hadronization is very important. Um, and if you don't apply soft drop grooming, then the hadronization is important for a lot bigger of this range. And so you, this is why you can't make an accurate theory prediction for it. So we wanted to measure this to test if these predictions were actually doing a good job. 
Um, and so this is the start of uh, our measurement, which you can see here, um, where you can see in this, uh, the green line here is the um, particle level distribution. So this is just, you know, basically what comes out of Pythia or some other Monte Carlo prediction. Um, and you can see it has kind of this nice falling shape here, and then you have a peak at the low mass region from hadronization. It falls off at really high masses. Um, but if you actually look at our data or um, after running any of this through the detector simulation, you see really big differences between um, uh, what we observe there versus what we would expect to see at truth level. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, not necessarily surprising. This means that our detector is having a big impact on how well we can uh, observe this. Um, but it, of course, we need to uh, account for this if we want to actually have a measurement that we can compare to a prediction with. Um, and so to deal with this, we use what's called unfolding. Um, so I won't go through this in great detail, but the basic idea behind unfolding is that it creates a map between what you would expect to measure um, with and without detector effects. So at truth level, um, here on the x-axis, and at your reconstructed level on the y-axis. And it creates a map between this, um, including effects from vacant efficiency factors, um, and it corrects for this. So it says, you know, if you have uh, measured this uh, distribution in your detector, this is what it would correspond to if the detector effects were not present. Um, and just one thing to point out about this, um, this uh, distribution here, a couple things actually, is that the more diagonal this is, um, the more, the better the correlation between your truth and your reconstructed values. Um, and so this, uh, you can see here that at high masses, um, larger values of rho, um, you have a much more diagonal matrix than you do at those smaller masses. Um, and if you look on the previous slide, then you can see that you know, the, these shapes up here um, at higher masses do seem to correspond better to what we see you know, in truth and reconstructed level than at lower masses. So this kind of checks out if you just look at the previous distribution and you look at this response matrix. Um, it, I think, so it, it applies everything as a, a bulk correction. So it doesn't take any specific uh, detector effect into account, but you know, it, it, it handles everything kind of as a whole. So it de deals with you know, resolution or um, smearing or stuff like this that you would see, or just a general shift in This is just estimated using um, this matrix here. Yeah, so it's basically you, you need to have some sort of Monte Carlo simulation to produce a matrix like this. So you need to have you know, a pretty accurate detector simulation, but we do check that we are still able, you know, that this uh, is robust against um, different uh, effects as well with our uncertainties. Um, so once we have applied these corrections, uh, you can see the final result here. Um, in, in the black points, black markers. And you can see that this looks a lot more like what we had seen a few slides ago with the truth level distribution that we would expect. So it has this kind of falling shape here, and then kind of this peak at low masses um, corresponding to where the hadronization comes into play. Um, and here we have a comparison to two different theory predictions, um, which might seem funny since I have four different marker styles up there. Um, but the two, the first two, the pink diamonds, um, these are part of the same prediction, um, but they uh, a leading order plus next to next to leading log um, prediction. Um, but the open markers correspond to where we expect the non-perturbative effects to be large. So we don't expect the agreement to be good um, with our data there. So if there is a disagreement, this is not a problem. Um, it just means that, uh, yeah, it isn't expected to work well there and maybe it doesn't. Um, whereas in the uh, other regions, it's uh, more expected for it to, to behave properly. Um, then in the two um, triangles here, we have first a pure analytical prediction. So this is um, not a Monte Carlo prediction. This is an actual um, prediction, you know, written out. Um, and this is a next to leading order plus next to leading log accuracy prediction. Um, while in the kind of the bluish triangle, this has the non-perturbative effects included. Um, and it does this in a way, it's basically looking at um, different Monte Carlos to see, you know, if we had this prediction, what would we expect the difference to be? And then it applies this difference um, to the calculation. 
So in general, the two triangles are very similar, except for in the, you know, the region where non-perturbative effects are large, um, because this is the only reason, region where you should see differences from that. Um, and so there's a few things to point out about, um, about this picture here of, um, of our data. So the first is, um, like I mentioned before, one of the nice things is that um, about the jet mass distribution, especially, uh, and one of the reasons that this is possible in the first place is that the, the mass is uh, factorizable. So different effects are important in different places. So in the low mass region, the non-perturbative region, um, the predictions don't agree with the data very well. I mean, it's not awful agreement necessarily, but it's, it's not really great either. Um, but they're not designed to work here. Um, and you can see that if you are applying non-perturbative corrections, so if you look at the blue triangles, um, they're a little bit closer to the data. So it's moving in the right direction at least. But here we can't really say much because this is not really where these predictions are supposed to be working anyhow. In the resummation region, this is where the, um, we're actually probing the parton shower. Um, you can see that in general, there's pretty good agreement overall with both of these predictions. Um, there's maybe some small disagreements, but um, overall it seems to work pretty well. So this is, you know, and you can see that in general, you have pretty small experimental and theoretical uncertainties here. So really we are um, able to do some pretty good tests of these, these new predictions. Um, and then finally, up in the high mass region, the fixed order region, um, you can see that the two predictions behave very differently from each other. Um, and this is because the fixed order part, or the you know, NLO part, is uh, very different. So one is only a leading order prediction, one's a next to leading order prediction. And as you would expect, the next to leading order prediction does a much better job in this region where you expect these fixed order effects to be important. So in general here, um, I think the main takeaways are that, you know, these predictions are able to do a good job of, um, you know, we, we are able to test these predictions very well, and these predictions are able to, you know, help us learn something about the underlying, um, you know, parton shower and the behavior um, of, of the jet formation. Um, oh yeah, and one, one last note um, I wanted to point out here is, as I mentioned before, you know, you can use different objects to reconstruct your jets. And all of these um, uh, studies I was showing so far were just using um, the cluster, the calorimeter information. Um, but tracks have a much better angular resolution um, and have, are less sensitive to different de detector effects, like pile up. Um, and so you can see here the response matrix for the unfolding for the cluster or the calorimeter based one and the track based one. You can see for the track based one, this is much more diagonal. So you can really see that the um, detector effects are going to be much smaller. Um, and in general, we have also quite small uncertainties on our track reconstruction as well. Um, so depending on what you wanna do, this can be very powerful. Um, unfortunately, if you want to compare it to these predictions, um, this is not really so possible with tracks because we don't have just charged particle only predictions. Um, but you can see a comparison here of a track-based versus a cal uh, cluster calorimeter-based uh, measurement of the jet mass, um, where here uh, things look, um, in general, the, the behavior of these are quite similar overall because we're, it's, this type of observable isn't so sensitive to um, you know, any particular scale of how much energy you have, it's uh, mass over PT. Um, but you can see that in general, the track-based observables um, are, have much smaller uncertainties. So if you really want to get very precise, using tracks can be very important. Um, so now I want to move on uh, to a second measurement, um, which kind of takes some of these ideas and pushes them further. Um, so the jet mass is obviously just one observable. Um, you know, there's a limit to what you can do uh, with just this one observable, a limit to how much you can learn about the parton shower itself. Um, so it's, it's important to think about how we can push this uh, to uh, push this a lot further. Um, so um, I'll be talking about a measurement of the Lund jet plane, but to start off, I just want to talk about the Lund plane, which is an idea that's been around for many, many years at this point. And it's been a way that theorists have talked about, um, you know, they use this to talk about jets. Um, and in this, um, in this conception of them, uh, you can say that a jet is approximated as a you know, series of soft emissions around a hard core. The hard core represents the original quark or gluon. Um, this might sound familiar from looking at some of the pictures I've been showing on the previous slides, or I hope it does at least. 
Um, and you can characterize these emissions based on you know, two parameters, uh, based on the relative momentum of one of the emissions, or of the emission with respect to the core, or Z. Um, so is this a really you know, hard or a soft emission? And then you can characterize it based on the angle um, between the emission and uh, the core of the jet. Um, and one of the really nice things about um, this uh, way of looking at, uh, uh, of thinking about a jet is it really factorizes different emissions um, into uh, different types of emissions and different types of effects into different parts of this two-dimensional uh, space of the Z and the delta R. Um, and you can see kind of a cartoon here. Obviously, reality is, you know, we don't have, you know, strict lines of where each different effect comes into play, but um, just a cartoon kind of demonstrating where different effects are going to be important. So, you know, non-perturbative effects tend to be important in the top corner of the plane. Parton shower is important in the bottom left corner. Um, and yeah, if this sounds familiar based on what I was saying about the jet mass, that's because it is. Um, the jet mass is a, essentially just one of the diagonal lines in this plane. So it's, you know, very closely related to um, this a little bit more general picture of looking at a jet. So the, the um, key here is that we can actually turn this into something that is measurable um, experimentally instead of just kind of a theory tool for thinking about jets. Um, the way this works here, um, again, is you start out, you reconstruct your jet, and then you recluster it, just like soft drop, into something that has, is more closely related to your actual parton shower. So you use the cambridge aachen clustering, reclustering. Um, and then again, like soft drop, you decluster it and you look at you know, the higher PT uh, uh, subjet and the lower PT one. But here, instead of just removing emissions, what you're trying to do um, is you're trying to actually characterize them. So here you say that the higher PT one, um, we know this one's higher PT because of how much energy was deposited here, um, is the core and the lower PT one is the emission. And you just make a plot and you continue declustering this, and you make a plot of each of the emissions, their Z and their delta R. And this goes into your plane. And then if you plot many jets instead of just this one that we have here, um, you can get a picture of where emissions tend to happen and how they tend to behave. Um, and so we did a measurement of this on Atlas, um, and we, where we measured the Lund plane in DiJet events. Um, and again, we used unfolding to correct for detector effects. I won't go through that again. Um, but uh, here we're using tracks, um, as I alluded to before, because this really gives us access to um, really small angular splittings. Um, and just to kind of orient yourself, um, I have a, a few different diagrams here to show what types of emissions are um, relevant for different parts of the plane. So up here in the top left corner, we have you know, a really wide angle emission that tends to be pretty well balanced. So both of them tend to be high, the core and the emission are high PT. Um, whereas down here, we have really collinear emissions that are relatively unbalanced. Um, there's a lot you can say about what this plane, what this plane looks like, this two-dimensional space. Um, I don't have time to go through all of the things you can learn from this, but I think it's worth pointing out just a couple of things. Um, so first is if you take uh, lines perpendicular to this, this blue arrow here, these are lines of constant um, alpha s. Um, or, or like alpha s at a certain scale. And so you'd expect that in, in these perpendicular lines that the uh, amount of emissions should be relatively flat um, across the space, which is essentially what we see. You know, you see this diagonal stripe here, um, though there's some differences obviously in the corners. And as the strong coupling constant increases, um, you have more emissions until a point. And this, is, this point is where the hadronization occurs. Um, there's a lot more information you can say about the Lund plane um, and a lot you can do with it, but just to, to kind of give a sense of a couple things you can think about here. Um, but of course, it's hard to say too much just by looking at this two-dimensional space because, um, you know, it's uh, just a plot of the data. You don't see any of the uncertainties. You can't compare it to other predictions very easily by looking in, in two dimensions. So I want to just briefly take a minute to look at just a single slice of this plane, so wh where this black uh, line is. And you can see this here compared to uh, six different Monte Carlo predictions. Um, so the unfolded data is in black, and then the other ones are in different colors, with the uncertainty band being in gray. Um, 
And these six different predictions are chosen very specifically. So the reason being that we have, uh, in the purple, we have Powhag and Powhag plus Pythia and Pythia. Um, and the difference between these is just in the fixed order calculation and not in the parton shower or the hadronization models. In the orange, we have uh, two different Sherpa models. And these have the same uh, fixed order predictions and they have the same uh, parton shower models, but they have different hadronizations. Uh, and then finally, in, we have the two Herwig models that have different parton showers, but the same fixed order predictions and the same uh, hadronization models. So if you see differences between the two blue markers or the two orange markers, or if you see, yeah, if you see differences between the two orange markers, this means that hadronization is important. If you see differences between the two blue markers, this means parton showers are important. Um, and in general, we don't see really differences in the fixed order part, so I won't, you know, talk about that really more. Um, so yeah, like I said, purple is fixed order, orange is hadronization, green is parton showers. Um, and you can see really nicely here, I'll go back to a slide without the colors in just a second, but um, you can see really nicely uh, that this, um, this slice really demonstrates the factorization beautifully. Um, so you can see in kind of the left part of the plane um, that there are large differences between your different uh, parton shower models. And this is, you know, this corresponds to the hard and wide angle region, which is exactly where you would expect these to come into play. Um, and so, yeah, you can really see that there are differences here where there are much smaller differences between the different orange markers. Um, up here in the region where more collinear effects are going to be important, remember how I said that hadronization tends to really change the collinear structure but not the overall picture of your jet. Um, so you can see large differences between your different Sherpa models, which is where the hadronization is important, um, but not large differences between your Herwig models in general. So you can see really beautifully that this factorization is illustrated just by looking at these, these different predictions and comparing to our data. Um, one other thing to point out here is that, okay, here maybe you would say just by looking at this picture that maybe the Herwig angular ordered shower is uh, doing the best and maybe we should just be using that everywhere. But I'll, I'll remind you that, um, you know, we are looking at one slice of this two-dimensional space. Um, and if you actually look at all of the data, none of these predictions do a good job across the, across the board of predicting how everything behaves. Um, and so there's a lot of room for us to improve our models um, by uh, doing measurements like this, which really uh, stress, uh, um, put stress tests on these different predictions by studying them across um, a really wide range of conditions. Um, so I want to just flash a couple of, um, you know, brief concepts of where this could be going in the future. Um, here, I don't have time to go into depth about some of the, the ideas, so um, yeah, I, I'm happy to talk about any of this more with people who are interested. Um, but I just wanna, yeah, talk about a couple of future directions for where all of this could be going. Um, so one of the, the ways that I think this is um, going to be very powerful in the future is by improving our models of jets. So if, um, for those of you working on CMS, um, you, many of you might use um, some sort of jet tagger to um, identify different types of jets from different sources. Um, and increasingly these use a lot of machine learning methods uh, in order to get the most information out of, um, out of the jets, which is really great and has led to a lot of um, ad advances that have made it possible to do new types of measurements and searches. Um, and they do this by using you know, in information about individual particles and their correlations. That being said, um, this means that we are really reliant on our models we're using to create these taggers. Um, and there can be really large, uh, large model dependence on, our, um, on the taggers, which would mean that you know, you're training your taggers to learn something that is unphysical um, and that you're not going to necessarily get the same performance in data as you do in Monte Carlo. So you can see here just a kind of example of this um, where this is a top tagger and you can see that you know, with four different Monte Carlo predictions, um, there's you know, up to 20% differences between um, in the signal efficiency um, between these different models. This is just one example. There are many more that you could make, um, of course, but uh, you, know, you can see really that you know, if you are trying to learn something and you get 20% differences uh, in your signal efficiency and who knows what your background efficiency changes will be as well, you know, this can have a really big impact on you know, 
how you have thought about your optimization. You know, maybe the optimization you did isn't actually going to be the same, give you the same performance in data. So by making measurements like the Lund plane, where we are really sensitive to specific effects, um, we can use this as uh, better inputs to tuning our Monte Carlo predictions. Um, and I, I won't go through this here, but we yeah, did some toy studies of trying to create some tunes um, with substructure measurements to see if we could um, get some improvements out of these. But of course, um, we, you know, if you have a bad model for things to start out with, um, you can tune all you would like, but it's, you're still going to end up with a bad model. Um, and so one other area that I think is really important is to test uh, new models that are actually improving our theoretical accuracy of these, um, of these parton showers in particular. Um, there's been a lot of work from various, uh, a, a couple of different collaborations of theorists on this um, towards making yeah, next to leading log accuracy parton showers. Um, and one thing that's going to be really important in the coming years is actually testing these models um, and looking for very specific effects to see that, you know, can we see these in data? Um, can we actually, are there, there are models that they're creating, are they actually something that we, you know, are they working as we would expect them to? Um, so this is something I'm very interested in. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think the other thing to point out here is, I mean, for anyone interested, I mean, certainly I'm working on uh, the Higgs, um, heavy flavor jets, um, Bs and Cs, pose very specific challenges for um, both theoretically and experimentally. And so this is also an area where more measurements are going to be important in the coming years. And I'm just gonna skip over this in the interest of time. Um, and I think here, I, I just will say a couple words. I mean, I think there's a lot of ways we can also think about these parton shower models, think about jet substructure in ways that can improve um, other types of physics we might be looking for. So looking for um, different types of dark sector models like dark showers um, or if we're doing, you know, electroweak measurements uh, to test, you know, things like electroweak symmetry breaking. Um, but um, I'm happy to talk about any of this more for anyone who's interested. But I just wanted to flash these as some of the concepts I'm thinking about that, you know, these, these uh, measurements and these ideas will apply to in the future. Then, yeah, finally here, I also don't have time to go through this in detail, but um, I think the last thing to point out is, as you can imagine, um, you know, we really are pushing the limits of our reconstruction with these, uh, with, uh, with jets and by looking inside of jets with jet substructure. Um, and so I think it's important to be thinking about what new technologies can we create now that will apply to future experiments that we might want to build. Um, and so something I've been interested in recently is uh, really fast uh, silicon timing detectors or low gain avalanche diodes, which have, you know, order of tens of picoseconds of timing resolution. Um, these have a lot of applications, uh, both to high energy experiments as well as other areas of non-collider physics. Um, and these are something that really need a lot of tests to understand how well we can use these and apply these to um, future experiments as well. Um, so I think it's very important to be thinking about the future and how we can improve things so that our, our future detectors are, we can get the most out of them and be able to continue doing um, the types of research that we are interested in. So yeah, just a few closing thoughts. Um, so our understanding of jets is going to really enable a, a more um, robust uh, search and measurement program at the LHC and beyond. Um, hadronic final states are really common. Um, we don't just use them in you know, these kind of uh, jetty events that I was showing here, but we also use them um, in uh, combination with leptons and for a lot of different types of physics that we do. Um, but as you can see here, they are also very messy and challenging to use. So if we can really understand things better and we can model them better, um, we can uh, really improve the quality and types of physics that we can do at the LHC. Um, I think the other thing I want to point out is, you know, precision jet substructure is a relatively new area of development. Um, predictions for any type of substructure observable really have only become available you know, in the last, uh, you know, five to seven years or so. Um, and so this is really somewhere where, you know, we're still trying to understand all the limits, all the capabilities uh, of these types of predictions. Um, and so it's really important that we are testing these. Um, and part of the reason for testing these is so that we can try to use them or similar measurements uh, to test uh, more fundamental properties of the standard model. So things like um, the strong coupling constant or the top mass or 
um, various other uh, things that you might be able to do with similar predictions, um, but with uh, slightly different applications. And similarly, um, you know, by, by testing these models, I think we are really enabling um, you know, developments in theory towards these, these future Parthon shower uh, models with higher accuracy. Um, and so I think you know, this is going to be a really important area for us to have experimental constraints on um, and improvements in our ability to figure out how we can actually test many of these very um, specific effects um, in the years to come so that we can apply these models uh, for the broader use in the, in, um, in the LHC and anywhere else uh, using JETS. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. A nice talk. Uh, we have time for questions. Let me just switch on the lights. Questions, anyone? So you, s <coughs> sorry, you said earlier that you're trying to tune the parton shower models, but I'm wondering, so how do you separate the parton shower effects from the hydronization effects? Yeah, I think this is why you need to have observables where this is possible. And this isn't true of all observables. Um, so things like the Lund plane, where you really are able to separate the very collinear effects where hadronization is important from the parton shower um, is uh, really what you need to be looking at. And I think the other important thing here to point out is that if you go very low in PT, like if you look at low PT jets, the parton shower and the hadronization region overlap a lot. So this line, this non-perturbative line, it moves down. Mm -hmm. um, and so the region that you can actually test is going to shrink. So, you know, these can be still interesting measurements, but they're not going, like, if you want to be testing the parton showers, you really need to push to higher PT, um, where you can actually have a wider range of this, this plane that is um, going to be sensitive to these effects, which is why we did this in high PT jets. Um, Just uh, models which contain various approximations, different models emphasize different things. Mm -hmm. So, so this is basically testing the models, not so much the fundamental theory. So, in this particular case, in this um, in this plot here, yes, um, to some degree. And I, I will also point out that you know these have not all been tuned with the same degree of care. So it doesn't actually mean that we're excluding one particular model over another. It could mean that we need to tune it better. That being said, um, the plot I am showing here is actually a plot of the Lund plane. Um, and this is a prediction from yeah, Gregory Soye and um, some of his collaborators. Um, and it's, uh, there are a couple you know, approximations made here because we did a track-based measurement and they're making some approximations for how to convert theirs to a charge particle. Maybe. Um, but here uh, you can see that, you know, they are able to make theory predictions for this as well. And it's a slightly different um, space that they are using than we are, but okay. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, there, it's possible to make these predictions. And a lot of the, the measurements that we will need for testing these parton shower models are basically testing things in various, you know, making various cuts on the Lund plane and measuring these essentially will, will allow us to access. Net, net, net NLO refers to net to the leading order. In what parameters are you prioritizing? So what, what, what is the expansion parameter that one uses here in the plot? I am not sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, sorry, point. yes. Um, I don't know how all the matching is done, I guess, because this is a, essentially an NLL prediction here, it just is resummation, but it's NLL. Um. Other questions? So one of the questions that came to mind uh, is you have a sort of construct your prescription for generating the Lund plane. Mm -hmm. Given the uncertainties in measurements, you may have hinted it when you talked about low PT versus high PT, but how unique is that? So are there multiple positions in the Lund plane that you could get given your uncertainties in measurement for a given event? You know, you measure positions as to a certain accuracy, you measure 
Yeah, so I mean, this is all accounted for. We have a lot of different experimental uncertainties, and I didn't want to get into all the details of our uncertainties here. Um, but all of this is accounted for in our uncertainties. So we have, um, I think the experimental one covers the track-based observables, uh, track-based uncertainties, and they're relatively small in general. The, I mean, you could just do unfolding in the loon plane directly, so you could take Yeah, 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 exactly. Goes. But you still have uncertainties which are going to limit how, how well. Like, if you tried to do this with calorimeters, um, you would just get really large uncertainties in the collinear region. Um, so in this part of the plane, you get really large uncertainties because uh, the migrations are just too large, and so your experimental uncertainties blow up. Um, but since we're using tracks, it, it, it stays pretty small. We're mostly limited by our modeling of, you know, what does the response matrix look like in different Monte Carlo predictions. So maybe let me ask you a question. So I, clearly it's important to test the new showering models and uh, to improve them. It's uh, joint work between theorists and experimentalists. But uh, for jet substructure algorithm or any specific algorithm like uh, even jet energy correction, I could be completely uh, agnostic. You know, I have billions of jets at the LHC. I have billions of j millions of jets from Ws and tops. So I don't really need the part in shower model to uh, use substructure variable and tune them. I, I just need some very basic ideas of QCD splitting functions, which are well known. And then I basically don't even need Monte Carlo because I have infinite samples of, of jets. That's the big advantage. There's no background to jets, right? So why wouldn't you do this approach? Just uh, use data to, to drive you. Um, I mean, I think partly here it's going to be hard to, I'm not entirely sure what you're suggesting, so I'm going to give an answer, but if it's not relevant, tell me. Um, I think it's hard to get a clean sample of exactly what you're looking for. I mean, we have cork and gluon jets, and we don't have any perfect way of identifying these. We don't even have a perfect way of saying what is a cork or gluon jet theoretically. Um, you know, uh, so, you know, if you want to use all the sample of the jets that we have, you know, what, how do you apply this to different final states? Well, you know, how do you deal with the color flow? How do you, you know, you can't necessarily take a jet in a die jet event and put that into, you know, a Z plus jet event, um, just, uh, as, as uh, it won't naturally translate. Well, let me give you an example. Say okay. you want to test grooming algorithms where the soft drop is better than something else, algorithm X, or you want to uh, compare some new jet substructure algorithm to tau one, two, or D1, mm. D2. So what you could do, for instance, you, you know, you, you have TT bar sample with uh, hundreds of millions of events, and a lot of them are boosted W, where you know for sure it's a W jet with two quarks, and uh, uh, here you go, you have millions, literally, events like that, mm -hmm. so you could immediately test your two or three, four models with the data without any reliance on the Monte Carlo whatsoever. I mean, for creating taggers? Or well, for grooming, right, because you know W mass, so you just see which algorithm gives you better W mass. I mean, that's, right? I guess, related to taggers. If you're talking about grooming in that context, that's related to how do you eventually tag this the best. Um, I mean, I, I think the question I'm trying to answer is slightly different than that because, you know, even if you do want to make a tagger in data, which um, we don't generally do because it's not always as simple to get a clean, as clean a sample as you might want. Um, I think the other thing to point out here is that even if you do make a tagger in data, you know, how do you actually, um, you know, you're still going to want to use Monte Carlo for some of your analysis as well. Like, you, there's a reason we rely on Monte Carlo. It's not just for creating taggers. Um, and so you still are going to need models of jets. And if your models of jets are awful, then if you've created a great tagger in data, you're still going to have trouble optimizing your analysis because you, it's not going to translate into the same sort of sensitivity and you are going to have a lot of modeling uncertainties on it. Um, so I think, you know, if you can do that, which, in the first place, it still won't translate to being able to, you, you can't just take your jets and use them for all of your, your studies in general. Um, 
I think it's also often hard to get as clean a sample as you will need to make, like there's a reason we don't generally train our taggers on data. Um, because it's challenging to get as clean a sample as you will need because that's the problem that we're trying to solve is what is what. And if you have Monte Carlo, this is a simple problem because you can label it, but in data you don't. And so it's, if you're trying to train something to learn what is what and you don't have a clean sample, then this is a harder problem to solve. Right, but even as Monte Carlo taggers, we always come up with scale factors based on data. So the, the, the fact that Monte Carlo is not uh, exactly a description of data is built in the whole uh, yes, but that doesn't, right? but you don't do derive the scale factors until after you've done your tagger optimization. Uh, and so, you know, if you're, you had two taggers that perform similarly, you chose one over the other, um, if the scale factors for one are uh, much, you know, more different from one than the other, or, you know, Yeah, so the one, one which better performs Yeah, but you might not know this worse. if you don't derive scale factors for both of them, and at least um, for us, on Atlas, it tends to take a very long time to derive these scale factors because these are challenging measurements to do, um, depending on what you're deriving scale factors for. But um, And so the optimization that you've done might not actually give you the optimal result if you're just doing it in Monte Carlo and your models aren't perfect. Um, because you might choose one that has a larger scale factor and so it might not actually perform in the way that you expect it to. Um, but let me ask you, some of different question which is related. So where do you see yourself, your, your role as an experimentalist? Because most of these models are done by theorists and they're very complex models because they include a lot of non-perturbative calculation, resummation, and this stuff. So you clearly could test models with mm -hmm. your data, but uh, how much in the, uh, of the development of these models can you influence by doing these tests? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, there's a couple things to point out here. So I think the first is, as an experimentalist, I know what is and isn't possible to measure. Um, and I, you know, oftentimes talking to theorists, they are not always clear on what are the experimental limitations and how will these impact, you know, some of the things they are suggesting would be useful for us to measure. Um, and this is something that I've discussed uh, with a few theorists recently where they've proposed things that are very challenging for us to measure. Um, and so just discussing with them the complexities of this and trying to figure out workarounds, figure out how we can both um, come to something where we can, it's well-defined theoretically and experimentally. Um, and I think, you know, by learning about these models, um, I also am able to give input on, you know, what sorts of things, you know, would test certain effects, but could I also measure? Um, because I know, you know, what they're trying to get and I am aware of, you know, some of the basic con, you know, like I, I can't do the predictions, but I can, you know, think about the, the ideas that they're trying to test and I can come up with things that are, are relevant. Um, yeah, so I think, I think the other thing to point out here is that a lot of the theory developments have been, um, you know, in many ways a collaborative effort between exper experiment and theory because I think many of the parton shower model developments wouldn't have necessarily happened without some of the uh, experimental measurements that we've been making because um, you know, these have provided really good tests for the theorists in relatively short time scales um, of the things that they uh, were thinking about. And, you know, it allowed us to demonstrate that what they're doing is uh, working well and, you know, that we are able to measure it, measure it precisely. Um, and so I think this is an area where, um, you know, we've really helped enable that um, through providing measurements of, uh, of these things. All right, thanks a lot. So, any last minute question? Savas, Savas, you just. Okay. Well, let's all stretch. Let's thank Jennifer again.